Welcome back to our Intermediate Financial Accounting class. We've been talking about cash as part of our overall discussion of the most liquid assets of a business, cash and our receivables. We talked all about controlling cash and using cash and what in, is included in cash and how it can be restricted. Now it's time to talk a little bit about receivables. And we're going to start by defining what exactly is a receivable. We have two options for receivables. One is accounts receivable. These are oral promises, usually. They're not governed by a really in-depth written agreement, but they're an agreement between two parties, usually between a company and their customers. That the company, the customers will repay what they purchased later on. Really, this got started as a grace period for companies where I, if I sell to you, you still have to turn around and sell it. You might not have the money. So if I sell to you on credit, then you're more likely to buy from me because you can buy it from me, go to your business, sell it, and then give me back the money. So as a way to actually generate more sales on my part, as part of that, I don't charge you interest because I don't want to reduce those sales. Again, it's part of hooking that customer. So I'm not going to charge interest unless you don't pay me in time. And then I transition to a note receivable which is our other category. Now, the most common form of these used to be accounts receivables that had or accounts receivable that hadn't been paid. What we do is we would go back to them and say, hey, if you can't pay us, then we're going to transition this into an interest-bearing note. And customers would do it because they had no choice if they wanted to keep getting their supplies. Nowadays, that's not the most common reason. Now it's more of a loan between parents and subsidiaries or a short-term loan that you make to another company as a quick investment. That's what we typically see now as a notes receivable, but we still do see companies that have not paid having their accounts receivable turned into notes receivable and getting charged interest until they actually pay for whatever it was they bought. And matter of fact, we all see this anytime we use our credit card. We all have a 30-day grace period, or 20-day or 40-day, depending on your card, where we can repay our credit card and we don't have any interest charge. And then after that, it starts bearing interest. So that's not exactly what we're talking about, but it's the same basic idea that every, you get this short grace period and then it transitions. Notes receivable more formally, they're a formal written promise. They include a lot of legalese in the contract to make sure whoever we've loaned the money to is going to pay us back. You can think about your credit card bill, relatively long, but not nearly as long as say a home loan with tons and tons of paperwork. So that's what we're kind of talking about here. Uh, a loan receivable usually is a much longer document that uh, we want to make sure all the points are in place so that we get paid. Now notes receivable, they're based on a certain amount of money, they're not based on the goods or service, and then they definitely do charge interest because now it's going to be a long time. Since we're talking about receivables, we're going to lump all of these together, but the reality is notes receivable can be either current or long term, depends on the contract that we've set up. So you'll often see a note receivable up in current assets because they didn't pay within the 30 day grace period but they have to pay within six to nine months and we're going to charge six or nine months worth of interest and you'll also see these loans due from other businesses like in the example we did in our balance sheet uh, back in that lecture or other notes receivable down in long-term investments so we'll see them there too. Now we're going to start our discussion with accounts receivable because that's what most of us are comfortable with we've seen that many times before and one of the big issues with accounts receivable are the discounts that we offer. Remember, accounts receivable are designed to generate sales. You don't have to pay now. You can buy, pay, buy now, pay later. We see these all the time. It generates sales revenue. So we do it. The other thing that we do with these accounts receivable is we typically offer some kind of a discount. Most of these you're familiar with because you've been offered this kind of a discount. It's called a trade discount. And that's where the salesman says, hey, if you'll buy today, I'll knock down the price by 50 bucks or if you'll buy more than a hundred then I'll reduce the price from a hundred dollars each to twenty to, to ninety five dollars each so these are discounts offered not by the accounting department or finance department to get people to pay but they're designed to get people to buy and from an accounting perspective we don't care about trade discounts we care about the final price charged to our customers so if the normal sales price is $100 and our salesman generates a, a 10,000 unit sale by only charging 90, we're only going to record the $90 because that's what was charged. We don't, we don't care about that $10 difference in the accounting journal entries. Now we might go back to the sales manager or CEO and say, hey, do you know how big this discount is? Because we might be losing a lot of revenue. 
but that's between the sales department and their managers. We're keeping track of what actually got charged to the customer. So trade discounts, again, don't show up in our books. What do show up in our books are what we call cash discounts. These are discounts designed to get people to pay. And you've seen these a lot. These are the famous 210 net 30 discounts where if you'll pay within 10 days we'll give you a two percent discount they're designed to get people to pay by by letting them pay a little bit less for their purchases now you and i tend to think of a two percent discount as being really small we don't worry about it too much i mean if i buy my wife a thousand dollar uh, sofa set we just moved so I'm thinking in terms of of living room furniture and washers and dryers but if I buy a thousand dollar set a two percent discount is only gonna come out to about 20 bucks it's really not that much but it can be a lot for a big business my very first accounting teacher way back in high school worked for a huge open pit copper mine called Kennecott Copper let me say it right Kennecott Copper Mines and they bought that huge mining equipment. And I don't know if you've seen these before, but I'm a pretty tall individual, and the wheels on these trucks are much taller than I am. More than six, eight feet tall. They're giant pieces of equipment. And they had purchased this brand new set of equipment, and they had this offer, this 210 net 30 offer. And they got to day 10, and they wanted to send the check right away because the discount, the 2% discount was going to be a couple million dollars and they couldn't find the bill from the customer or from from their vendor they couldn't find it and the entire accounting department shut down and they all looked for this bill because it was worth everybody's time to save this multi-million dollar two percent discount so it may seem like a small they found it by the way and they they got it taken care of it may seem small to us two percent that's not a big deal but if you're buying ten thousand units or huge pieces of equipment this can add up really fast so there is a large incentive here for co companies to pay it back it's worked really well for companies to let people have this two percent discount to get them to pay quickly now from an accounting perspective we have to keep track of this because we charge a hundred dollars and they may only pay 98 well, there's a difference there that we have to keep track of, and we have two ways to keep track of it. The first is what we call the gross method. Under the gross method, which is the more common, we assume you are not going to take your discount, and we record the full $100 price in accounts receivable. Now, if you do pay within the 10 days, good, we got our cash, we're happy, we record a sales discount to show that you didn't have that extra 2% that had to be paid. Then if you don't pay, then we don't have to worry about it later because we just get the full amount and we've already accounted for that. Now the next method, the net method, makes the opposite assumption. We assume everyone is going to get their 2% discount. So we record the initial purchase at the discounted amount because we assume you're going to get it. Then if you don't pay within 10 days, then instead of recording a sales discount, if you do pay within the 10 days, we record a discount forfeited for the amount that you miss and if you pay on day 12 or day 29 and you don't get the discount. So it's just a difference in when we think our customers are going to pay. And we choose based on what's going to be easiest for us. If most of our clients do get the discount, then the net method works best. It's really easy. I don't have a discount account I have to keep track of. If, on the other hand, most of our customers don't pay within the 10 days, then we use the gross method. Then we don't have to worry about recording a discount except on the rare occasion when they do pay early. Now, let's go ahead and do an example of our cash discount so we can see how these two methods work. So here's our example. Jones Incorporated won a new customer. They offered a $100 sales price instead of the normal $110 per unit. The cost of goods sold is $75 bucks each. That's what Jones paid for them. Jones has terms of 210 net 30 for all of their sales. We want to do the journal entry for the customer's first order of 10,000 units using both the gross and the net methods. So let's see, I'm going to put a line down here and then we'll put the gross method on this side and we'll do the net method on the other side so we can see them side by side. Now again with the gross method we assume they are not going to take the discount so I'm going to record the full sales price. So I'm going to debit accounts receivable and credit sales revenue for one million dollars 
and we'll come down here. This is 10,000 units times $100 each. That's my million. And you'll notice I use the 100. I don't use the 110 because the, that difference between the 110 and the 100, that's a trade discount. And I don't care about trade discounts from the kind perspective. I just care what we really charge the client and what we really are going to get as revenue. So I don't care about that $10 difference. Now, let's just for fun, let's assume it's a perpetual company, and let's record the cost of goods sold as well. And that's, we'll come down here again, that's going to be, let's see, 10,000 units times $75 a unit, so 750,000. And this is to sell 10,000 units to a new customer hundred dollar sales price there's the one place that I keep track of the fact that this is not my normal 110 it doesn't win the journal entries at all but I might include it in the note and this is terms of 210 net 30 that's my gross method that records the sale now let's do it for the net method under the net method the basics are the same dollar price to 10 net 30 and the amount that's in cogs isn't going to change what changes is the amount that I'm going to put into my receivable account so we need to come down here and do this calculation 10,000 units times a hundred dollars is the same 1 million that I calculated before, but I assume they're going to get the discount. So I'm going to multiply that by 1 minus my discount rate. So this becomes 2%. But I'm going to multiply by 1 minus 0.02, 2%, or 0.98. So 1 million times 0.98 is 980,000 and that's what I'm going to record right here. That's how the gross and net methods work at least from the initial sale. Again with the gross method I keep track of everything. I assume you're not going to get the discount and I'm going to put it all in my accounts receivable under the net method. I assume you are going to get the discount. I put that net amount I think I'm going to get from you into my accounts receivable. That's really the difference between these two. We're recording what we think we're going to get from our customers. Under the gross method, we think we're going to get all of that sales price. So that's what we record. Under the net method, we think they're going to get the discount. So I record that discounted amount. I can't just do it one way or another for different customers. I have to choose for my whole company. So I choose what's most common. I think most of my people are going to pay everything. I think most of my customers are going to pay just the net amount, the discounted amount, and that's what I record. Now, in our next segment, we'll come back and we'll start doing the journal entries as the payments are made so we can continue seeing the differences. We'll see you then.